What's up guys? Today I'm going to show you how I built my first ever aircraft display base in just a single afternoon using only two main products and a dead simple process for doing groundwork that includes a method for painting and weathering realistic concrete airfields. It's honestly so easy that even an aircraft modeler like myself can get a great result on the very first try. So without further ado, Let's get going on this Eduard 172nd scale Spitfire Mark 9 Weekend Edition kit. We're going to be building it as a North African American service Mark 9 today because this is a scheme that I've always wanted to do and I've had the paint sitting around for a long time actually. I also, as you'll see, had masks and photo etch from a different Spitfire kit since this is a weekend edition. Looking at the sprues, you can see the rivet detail is awesome, even in 172nd scale, and opening up the instructions, they are clear and concise, as Eduard always is. The nice thing about 172nd scale is that there's a few fewer parts, too, so the build goes together pretty quickly and easily, as long as you have good tweezers, that is. Moving forward with the parts cleanup, I break out my glass razor file that I got from USA Gundam store because to me it's the best thing for cleaning up parts that I've ever found. Then I go on and I start with the wings because hey, why always start with the cockpit first, huh? I glue them together with my Tamiya Extra Thin, being sure to squeeze them together to get a little splooge out so that I don't have any gaps that putty needs to fill. The MRP interior green comes out and I use it in combination with my Tamiya LP11 to get that classic Spitfire interior. It really came out nicely, so then I moved on to my photo etch. Remember, if you cut your photo etch on a glass or ceramic base, you can keep it from bending, which is really handy since bent photo etch doesn't look good on anybody. After getting it on, I just hit it with a flat coat and then take a toothpick that I use to put gloss on each dial to get a nice realistic glossy dial finish. After that, it's just a matter of using some dry brushing to pick out the details on the seat, bend the seat belts on, and then break out the flat coat for them once again. And the result, I think, is a pretty good cockpit even in tiny 172nd scale. Next, I start to mix up a dark wash, spill the thinner all over my bench, clean that up, and continue with my wash. Dark washes seem to suit interior green the best to my eye, so I start with black and just mix a little bit of raw umber in as I see fit. The result is simple and not overly weathered, but I think in this scale, it suits my eye. I pulled out the pre-cut Edward masks and actually had a little bit of a disaster because some of them were stuck to the backing paper and I couldn't use them. This was the case for the front window specifically, so I had to go old school, press some tape on there, and trim it myself. It came out fine, but I thought it was funny to see these masks fail in that way. They're only a couple years old, so just something to watch out for. I prime the plane up in some Mr. Surfacer 1500 black and then move on to filling any seams now that the plane is primed and I can see them. I had one major seam in the front fuselage so I patched it up with a little bit of Mr. Surfacer 500 and then cut a Tamiya sanding sponge 600 grit into little cubes that I sanded down using tweezers. Once that was done I was able to continue forth with my pre-shading. I didn't want an aggressive pre-shade or aggressive paint job in general for that matter on this plane, so I just tried to outline the panels and rivets using a little bit of Tamiya LP1 white, and I think it was a nice subtle pre-shading job that suited the camo colors that were to come. Using MRP, Middle Stone, and Dark Earth, I began on the camo job and slowly built up one layer at a time. Something to keep in mind when you're doing this is that when you dust the paint on super lightly for these layers, it can come out a little bit rough. So make sure that even if you're using lacquers or the like, to leave it a little bit wet so that you don't have any paint roughness to contend with later. My clear coat cleared it up, haha, but it still was something I wish I had avoided in the first place. 
After getting the middle stone down, I cut out paper masks using tape and a pen. This worked well for flat surfaces like the wings, but the fuselage needed some silly putty because the tape just wasn't bending and drawing smoothly. But that was okay because in the end, I actually liked the result from the silly putty more, and next time I think I would take the time and effort to just do the whole thing in silly putty. You get naturally softer edges from it, and in a, even in a small scale like this, I think those soft edges just look a little better. I don't like the totally soft, hand-drawn camo look, especially in a small scale, but you know, at the end of the day, this is all a matter of taste, right? Pulling off masking is still one of the most satisfying parts of modeling, and it makes drawing on these complicated camo schemes totally worth it. I was really happy with how the model was looking at this stage. Finishing up the camo, I broke out the Mr. Color Azure because I didn't have any MRP Azure laying around and I didn't want to wait for it to come in the mail. Regardless, that was totally fine because Mr. Color paints are always great. And as you'll see, GX100 is my favorite varnish to use at this stage, so I hit the whole model with a layer of varnish in preparation for decals. These Edward decals were also something I was really pleased with, and I'm not sure if they're the new ones or not, but they came out really well. I needed a few layers of Mr. Mark Softer to get them to lay down, but the good part is that they're very resilient and don't get the decal burn that some decals like Tamiya might get. So I didn't need to worry about overdoing it and I just used a few layers until they laid right down and I varnished back over them. All in all, they looked pretty painted on and I was able to use my flat coat of GX114 to finish the model off. I tried something new for painting the propellers by base coating the yellow tips with red to improve the coverage, and long story short, I don't think it was worth it. Use pink primer if you have it, but the red coat, eh. My exhaust stains are a simple light gray mixture that I went very lightly with, accompanied by some chipping with the Prismacolor silver pencil. I will say I made a mistake here, however, by doing the chipping before my oil work, because the oils wiped it right off and I just had to redo it all at the end. Not a huge deal, but pretty annoying and you don't want to have to go back and redo work if you can possibly avoid it. You'll see the oil work started with a nice dusty wash going on the wings that I built up around the rivets and then moved into a darker, grimier wash on the upper fuselage behind the engine. I focused mostly on the panel lines here because I just didn't want this bird to be a super dirty mess. I just liked the way it looked cleaner. You know, some can be dirty, some can be clean, right? You don't have to be married to one style or the other. I finished the wash with a little bit of Starship filth on the bottom that I then transitioned into some oil dots that built up the dirty surface of the exhaust uh, and general dirt and grime that builds up on the bottom of these Spitfires. I think I would have gone a little less heavy on the streaking next time and focused more towards the panel lines and streaks coming off of specific parts, but hey, it's all a learning process, right? Every model is getting better than the last. I did do something a little different on the bottom of the plane, though, by using some very heavily thinned Tamiya buff to create a dust coat that went down around the landing gear bays by the wingtips and other places that dust would build up, and it was a nice finishing technique to give a little bit more depth and tone down some of the oil work that I felt was a little bit too strong. I'll definitely be using this on planes similar to this one in the future. Now that the plane's done, we can get started on the diorama base. I used some styrofoam that I bought at my local hobby store because I saw they had it and I got a little bit excited, but I wouldn't do it again. Next time, I'd get some XPS insulation foam from Home Depot, as well as a hot wire knife from Amazon, because for $19, it's going to cut a whole lot better than this Extendo box cutter did. The result was 
eh, okay, but as you'll see, the sides got a little bit crumbly, and even though I painted them with some Tamiya black to even out the effect a little bit, I just wish it wasn't like that. This isn't a diorama base that's going into a competition or anything, so it wasn't the biggest deal in the world, but in the future, I'm definitely going to want a better result than this one. Now here's where it gets fun. After drawing out the basis of my design, I whip out the Ammo Acrylic Concrete product that I really, really liked. All you gotta do is cut out a piece of extra plastic, or ideally a putty knife, spread it over your diorama base, flatten it out as best you can, and then use a few drops of water to further get a flat, smooth surface. You want it to be as flat as possible because even though it shrinks while it dries, it makes it easier if you front load the process a little bit. After that, I broke out the Ammo Terraform Pacific Sand. Again, a product that I really ended up liking because it's simple, water-based, and you can just spread it around and sculpt it really easily. Shout out to Modest Modeler for showing me these products in a video where she made a similar base. I really wouldn't have known to use them without her, so go check out her channel and watch her diorama videos as well. After smoothing out the Pacific sand, I just used a brush to rough up the sand a little bit to make it more realistic and then blend it into the concrete the way dirt would blend over concrete in an airfield naturally. The end result looked really good and I just hit it with a little bit of 280 and 400 grit sandpaper to smooth the concrete out for a 170 second scale effect. After doing that, I was ready to cut the concrete block lines into my concrete block using a hobby knife and my L square. Go slowly when you do this and cut thin, thin cuts that you slowly widen into bigger ones. To paint the concrete, I use a simple post shading method of dark, medium, and light grays that build upon each other, giving tonal variety and depth to the final result. Because of this process, you don't need to worry about getting 100% coverage, and a little bit of randomness is good. If you look at reference photos of concrete, you'll actually see just how many different colors and variations there are in it. And in fact, there was way more than I thought there would be, so next time I'm going to go even further on this technique because I think we could push it much more than I originally thought. Regardless, the final result is looking pretty good, but it's a little bit cool and dark, so I decided to give a light mist coat of deck tan to warm it up a little bit, and I think this looks a lot more like regular concrete. After doing that, I figured it was time to start on the groundwork, so I tried to dab on some alcohol in preparation for the white glue and tiny stones, but it didn't really work so well. So after they were already on, I used a dropper to drop alcohol on and then mix on my diluted white glue using a paintbrush, and that worked much, much better. For those who don't know, the glue and alcohol is a solution that doesn't have surface tension the same way. Then I just stole my girlfriend's tea strainer and put my static grass on top. The key for the static grass for me on this piece was to not have an even coverage, but leave a little bit of spottiness where the dirt would be shining through more in some places. To tie it together, I broke out my Mr. Mahogany 1000 surfacer and primed all of the groundwork to give it a uniform cover. This turned out to be a little darker than I think I would do next time. So I would either not start with that primer or maybe start with a lighter color than the flat earth. You'll see regardless though that the flat earth highlights certain details and adds a little bit of depth even on top of the dark base layer. Then in typical post shading style, I bring out the dark yellow to pull the grass out even further. It's really kind of funny how using browns and yellows makes the grass look like grass rather than green. Now, of course, I would use green if I wanted a more spring or summertime look, but I figure we're in the desert, the grass is mostly dirty and dead, so let's just post shade it with these browns and tans. Then I found these army painter tufts that I really, really ended up liking at my local hobby store. So I started gluing them on by just painting the base of them with a little bit of diluted white glue like the grass and trying to stick them on in a 
random way that still had a little bit of nice composition to it, mixing smaller and larger tufts. I also really liked the way they came out, but they didn't tie into the groundwork perfectly. So I came back with my buff, the last post shading color, and I just dusted the top of each tuft with a little bit of buff, say that three times fast, and that really pulled the whole thing together and came out with some groundwork that I was pleased with. Perhaps it's a little bit dark for the desert, but hey, this is the first try, right? After that, I just dirtied up the concrete a little bit using some raw umber oil paints around the edges of each block and did my best to blend it in a little bit and add a little bit of a randomness to the concrete. Finally, I came in with a Starship Filth pin wash because another thing you'll notice about concrete if you look at reference photos is that the lines separating the blocks are actually fairly dark and it really does punch up the final piece in a nice way. Finally, I did some random speckling, and after that, I think it's time to see what the result looks like. Alright, I just want to thank you guys so much for watching this video and say that I really hope it either taught you some new techniques or inspired you to try building something like this for yourself. I think you'll be really surprised at how rewarding this kind of thing can be. And if you did enjoy this video and would like to do me a favor, please go ahead and subscribe. I'm trying to hit that magical 1000 subscriber mark, so it would really mean everything to me. I've got a super cool project that I can't wait to show you guys coming up for the next video. But until then, push the limits, make some diorama bases, and keep having fun with your modeling, guys. It really is the best hobby in the world. Until then, CJ Builds, over and out.